Hello everyone, welcome back to another Engineering Statics lecture video. Now, before we begin, I always want to say I just hope that you guys are doing well. Hopefully you guys have a big smile on your face because I'm about to take that away. <laughs> Let me just apologize in advance for this video because this right here is often either the worst or the second worst topic uh, students seem to find for Engineering Statics and that is force reduction. Now, it's one of those topics that becomes complex because it's not really apparent what questions are asking. So hopefully I, uh, I do a good enough job to show you guys what exactly it means by force reduction. Now, for those curious students who are saying, well, what is the other worst topic? Well, that is friction. So friction is something we cover kind of towards the end of the course. Again, people really hate it. But uh, pre-midterm material, this is the one that students always hate the most. So again... If you're smiley and happy, I apologize because I'm about to change your day. <laughs> so uh, buckle up, let's talk about force reduction. So force couple systems. So a lot of the time before we talked about how if we have a lot of forces acting on a particle, we can actually simplify it to a single resultant force. So again, we have our particle, we had a lot of forces acting upon it, and we were able to take all of those forces and combine them into a single force, which we call the resultant force. Now, finding this resultant force was actually fairly simple. The hardest part was getting all of our forces into Cartesian vector notation. But once we did, we can find the resultant force simply by adding everything together. Now, the trick here was we had a concurrent system, which means all of those forces acted at the same point, so it made our lives a lot easier. Now, in the past couple of videos, we've been talking about moments and what happens when forces do not act at the same point. So the question becomes, for non-concurrent systems where our forces are all acting at different locations, how do we find a resultant force and a resultant moment? So let's say initially we are given this scenario where we have four forces, but they're all acting at different directions. How can we simplify this system right here? Well, the good news is, is the resultant force is going to be the same procedure. So the resultant force, if I wanted it, all I have to do is add all the forces together as such. But I got a little bit ahead of myself because you notice when I clicked, we also have something called a resultant moment. All right, so we had a resultant force, which is just all the forces added together, but we're also creating a resultant moment. And this is where things get a little bit tricky. How do we get that resultant moment? Well, it's actually fairly simple. Sounds tricky, but it's actually simple where the resultant moment in this case is simply going to be the moment created by force 2 plus the moment created by force 3 plus the moment created by force 4. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, what about the moment created by force 1? So this is where you guys as students have to be very cautious because if we look here, we are finding the resultant force and moment about a specific point. This is where things get tricky. Is the resultant force and moment about a point is going to be different than the resultant force in a moment about a different point. As we'll see, the resultant force actually is going to be the same, but the moments change depending on which point we want. So in this particular case, I found the resultant force in moments about point one. And if we look to the left-hand side here, we know that force one acts directly through point one. And we know that if a force acts through a point, <laughs> this is not really what I was trying to go for, but if a force acts through a point, it doesn't create any moment. That's why we don't have moment one here. Now, if you guys are kind of thinking ahead, you guys are gonna say, uh-oh, this is going to be a huge pain in the ass. And you're right, because remember, for moments in 3D, we need to do cross product. So if I wanted the moment two, moment three, moment four, I actually am going to have to create position vectors from point one to each one of those forces and then cross them together. So in this particular scenario, if it's three dimension, I have to do the cross product three times. And this is why that previous video, when I talked about moment couples, that's why that's so important. Is that will allow us to save us a lot of time in these particular scenarios. Typically what happens in exams is they actually give you these four forces. And what'll happen is they'll want the uh, resultant force and moment about let's say point one. Well, we know that force one isn't going to create a moment. So there's one cross product eliminated. And what they'll typically do is they'll have the other two forces being couples, so we only have to do the cross product once, and then they'll have that additional force wherever, and you have to do the cross product for that one. So it's very important to know how moments are created 
So when we get to these scenarios, you guys know the best approach to quickly find all of those moment components. All right, so not too bad so far. So let's talk about the procedure. I find that procedure always helps students kind of visualize, okay, what are my steps going to be and why are the steps the way that they are? So if we want to create an equivalent force couple system, and that basically just means a resultant force and a resultant moment, well, what we do is we take our 3D vector space, we take our two forces, and we follow basically the same procedure. So in this particular case, if I wanted to create a force couple system about point, point 0.0, that's going to say point 0.0, but point 0.0, the steps would be as follows. The first one is we need to determine the moment both of these forces create about point 0.0. So for example, if I'm looking at force A, so FA, what I would have to do is I would have to create a position vector that goes from point O to any location on FA and then cross them together. That'll give me my moment about point O from force A. The problem is, is I have to do the exact same thing for force B. So I have to create a position vector from O to B or force B. Remember the the position vector can be at any point along the line of action of the force and I cross them together. So this is where it actually becomes quite tedious is this first step right here because the first step requires cross product and the cross product can be a time consuming operation. It's not too bad but it still is one of the more lengthy uh, operations we have. So that's the first step creating the moment each force creates about the point of interest. From there we move on to a simpler step and that is finding the resultant force. Now again, that's the easiest one because if I have FA and FB in Cartesian vector notation, all I need to do is add the components together, I get my resultant force no problem. The second one is determine the resultant moment. Now this one's also easy because if I have MA and MB in Cartesian vector notation, which you should because remember cross product returns the vector in Cartesian vector notation, so it should be no problem. All I have to do is add the components together, I'm looking good. And then finally, most professors would like you to draw kind of what just happened. So we have our original situation above, and we should draw that. Okay, we went from that situation where we had two forces to this situation where we now have a resultant force acting at point O, and we have a resultant moment acting at point O. So this is kind of what we did. We took two forces that did not act at point O, and we converted them into an equivalent force couple system that acts at point O. Now the trick here is this, wherever the point of interest is, it's going to change the result in moments. Because remember, we're taking moments about specific points. So if they wanted this force couple system at a different point, let's say point P, well, the cross products are going to change. So it's something to keep in mind. Now you guys may be taking a look and saying, well, you know, Clayton, not too bad. All I basically have to do is take moments, add them together, find the forces, add them together, and draw a little picture. Nice and easy, right? Well, yes and no. For the most part, this is simple, but the questions typically don't end here. Once you guys have this equivalent force couple system, that's when the fun begins because the professors can ask for two other things. And the first one is the simpler of the two, which is a single force. So at this point right now, we have a resultant moment and a resultant force. But the professors can ask you, where can we move that resultant force such that it creates our resultant moment. So that's the key here. We can take our resultant force and move it so that it creates our moment. Now the best example is I'm going to use my phone again. And let's say that my resultant force is at the very bottom right here. My resultant force would simply just push my phone uh, horizontally. And at this point here, we have a resultant moment which is going to rotate my phone as such. Now, if I were to take my resultant force and start moving it upwards and then push, as we can see, my force now creates the moment. So that's what we're trying to do is we're going to move our resultant force so that it creates our resultant moment. This will allow us to take our system from a force vector and a moment vector to simply just a force vector. Now, I got more pictures to show you guys what exactly is going on, so uh, don't be too scared. So let's say we have our 3D vector space, and from the last slide, we figured out what our resultant force and our resultant moment is. Now, the next part of the question would say something like, move the resultant force such that it creates our resultant moment. So we're taking this situation and we're converting it 
to this situation, where again, I moved my resultant force so that it creates our resultant moment. Now, the question becomes is, well, what exactly are we solving for? Remember, at this point, we know what the moment is. We know what the force is. The thing that we actually don't know is what is the coordinate point of this force? Where exactly do we move this force to? Well, the process is actually going to be fairly simple. It's basically cross product, but in reverse. So in this case, again, we know what our force is, we know what our moment, we want to solve for that unknown coordinate point. Well, of course, we know that we do the cross product. If we have a force and a moment, and we're looking for a coordinate point, it's going to look something like this. Where we know that if we want to find the moment the force creates, we're going to take a position vector, cross it with that force vector to get that moment vector. Now, in this case, again, we know FR, we know MR, it's actually the position vector that becomes unknown. So if we look at that position vector more closely, we know that a position vector is simply going to be the coordinate points of where uh, we end up minus our initial coordinate points. So if we look at the coordinate points here, and we are going from the origin over to point C, well, our actual only unknown is going to be that coordinate point that we want to solve for. That point RO, we actually already know that one. So this is what we're trying to do, is we're trying to solve for that coordinate point RC. The question becomes is how exactly do we rearrange the cross product to figure this out? Well, actually, we don't. So that's kind of the hard thing about the cross product, is it's not as simple as taking something and dividing it, rearranging. We actually have to use more complex mathematics. The nice thing is, though, is when I do this, I simply don't try and reverse anything. What I do is I just carry out the cross product with unknown variables. And you guys say, Clayton, what the hell does that mean? Well, let's show you guys through an example. So let's say from the previous slide, I find my resultant force to be 49 minus 5j plus 20k. And I find my resultant moment to be minus 10i minus 40j minus 3k. Again, this just came from the last slide where I took all of the separate forces, added them together. I took all the separate moments and added them together. Now the question becomes is where can I move this force such that it creates this moment? So let's say in the question they say, all right, you got RB minus RA. And let's say that our unknown coordinate point has to be in the XY plane, all right? So we know that if our coordinate point is in the XY plane, it's going to have an X component, a Y component, and the Z component is actually going to be zero. So if we look here, we actually have two unknowns, X and Y. Now, if I were to carry out this position vector formula, I'm going to take the coordinate point of the unknown, which is x, y, and 0, and I'm going to subtract it from where I started. In this case, I'm starting from the origin, so it would be minus 0, 0, 0. So I actually get my position vector to be x, i, plus y, j, plus 0, k. So notice how I'm carrying out the problem like I already have the initial variables. The only thing is, is that in my position vector here, I actually have two unknowns but I'm just gonna leave them as unknowns for now. So now I'm gonna move on to my cross product. Again, I know that the moment created is going to be my position vector cross with my force vector. So I'm gonna carry out the cross product as normal and where I have my position vector components, I actually substitute the variables in. So instead of saying one, two, and three, something like that, I have X, Y, and zero, where X and Y are still unknowns. From here, I'm going to do whatever method I want to figure out what this cross product is equal to. You guys know I use the fish method. You guys can use whatever method suits you. And I can find that my cross product gives me the following vector. 20y in the i direction minus 20x in the j direction plus negative 5x minus 14y in the k direction. So the question becomes, all right, I did this, but I still have my unknowns. But remember that this resultant vector that we just got from the cross product, this actually has to be equal to our moment vector. So we know that that i component, that 20y, that actually has to be equal to negative 10. We know that that j component, negative 20x, that has to be equal to negative 40. And finally, that negative 5x minus 14y, that has to be equal to the negative 3. So from here, we have basically three little equations. We have 20y is equal to negative 10, negative 20x is equal to negative 40, and then we got that final one for the k components. Luckily for us, if we look at the i and the j component, we can very quickly solve that the x must be equal to 2, 
and y must be equal to negative 0.5. So it's actually not too bad at all. Now you guys may be saying, all right, Clayton, it was only easy because we knew it was in the xy plane. We had two unknowns and seemingly three equations. Well, what happens if they give you something like x, y, and z as unknowns? Then this, this gets really messy really quick. But I'm going to tell you guys a secret. They will never give you three unknowns. And the reason why is because with three unknowns, there's infinite solutions. Remember, when we're taking a position vector to determine a moment, we can go to any point along the line of action of the force. And if we can go to any point, there is theoretically infinite points, therefore infinite solutions if they made it in terms of x, y, and z. So what professors will always do is they make it look like they're being nice, but they're actually making it so that it's possible to solve. And they'll say, uh, this point has to be, let's say, in the x, y plane, the y, z plane, something like that. So there's actually only two unknowns. And since there's two unknowns, it makes our lives a lot easier when trying to solve it. Again, they can't do x, y, z because there's infinite solutions, because there's infinite points along the line of action of our force. So this is going to be the first kind of question they can ask you after we get our couple system. Now the second one, and this is if you really piss off your professors, is a wrench. And you guys are saying, what do you, what do you mean wrench? Like, isn't that something that we, we turn a bolt with? Well, yes, that's true. That's what a wrench is. But a wrench in statics here is when our force couple system is reduced such that the resultant force and the resultant moment act in the same direction. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, words are words. I don't know what words are. Show me a picture. Well, you got it. So let's say that we do all of our fancy math and we get that we have a resultant force and a resultant moment. What a wrench is, is when we simplify this system into the following system, where we have our force component still the same, but our moment component is now parallel with our force component. And how do we do this? Well, we simply move our force component. So we have to ask ourselves, how exactly do we determine a wrench from that initial scenario? So this is the worst possible exam question you guys can have. I've seen it, I think, once in all my years. And that, that <laughs> that's when you really make the professor mad. So don't make the professor mad. If you do that, expect a wrench in your midterm or your final because it's, again, the worst thing students can have. But it's actually not too bad once you know the procedure. So let's look at the steps on how we actually create a wrench. So remember, initially, the first thing we have to do is solve for our resultant force and our resultant moment. So this is our initial scenario where we have a moment vector and we have a force vector. Now, this is when we have to kind of think back a couple videos ago to the idea of projections. Remember that a moment component or a moment vector can be split up into a parallel and a perpendicular component. So for this particular moment vector, I can actually split it up into two separate vectors. A parallel component, which goes in the same direction as my force vector, and a perpendicular component, which goes perpendicular to my force vector. How did we do that? Well, we used dot product. So if I wanted the magnitude of that parallel component, all I'm going to do is take our, my moment vector and I'm going to dot it with the unit vector that describes the line of action of the force. So again, I put a little f there. That unit vector is the unit vector of our force vector. That's the direction we want. But keep in mind that that component is simply just a magnitude. It's not an actual vector. So what we need to do next is say, all right, I know the magnitude of this vector, but I need to actually find the vector itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the parallel and perpendicular moment component vectors. So we know if we know the magnitude of a vector and we want it in, in the Cartesian vector notation, all we have to do is multiply it by the vector defining its direction, which is nice because if we look at this parallel vector, we know it goes in the same direction as our force vector. Therefore, the parallel component in vector form is actually just going to be the magnitude of the parallel component, which we solve for using the dot product above, multiplied by the unit vector of our force vector. So now we have m parallel as a vector. Well, how about the perpendicular component? Well, this just goes back to vector addition, where our moment vector is the sum of the parallel and perpendicular components. So all we need to do in this case to find the perpendicular component is take our moment vector and subtract the parallel component. 
So hopefully I haven't lost you guys yet. This is again the worst type of question. If you guys can understand this, you guys are good to go. Now at this point, all the hard work is actually done and we're basically good to go with one step remaining. So again, what we want to do now is move our force vector so that it creates the perpendicular components. Remember, if we look up at the top here, our goal is to still have that parallel component, that M, that red component. We don't want that to disappear. What we want to disappear is the perpendicular component. So we're going to do exactly what we did in the previous page, but in this particular case, we just want to move it so that the perpendicular component disappears. And we do that through the cross product. In this case, if we have a position vector from O to our new point, multiplied, or I guess crossed with our force vector, we want that to be equal to the perpendicular component. So here's the key here that distinguishes this from the previous slide. In the previous slide, we wanted to get rid of the entire moment. So we used M as a whole. In a wrench, we want to only get rid of the perpendicular component. So in this equation, we're only doing the perpendicular components. We are not doing the whole moment. All right, so hopefully that makes sense to you guys. So if we look at this particular case, the only unknown that we actually have is going to be that position vector. And we can use the same procedure that we had on the previous page to actually solve for that unknown coordinate point. So as we can see here, a wrench, it sucks ass. I'm not gonna lie to you, it blows chunks. No one wants to do a wrench. So if you guys, uh, if you guys want to avoid this, just make sure you guys are nice to your professors. If, if not, then you guys may expect this on the midterm and that's the last thing anybody wants because you guys see the steps, it involves a lot and it really tests your theory on what's going on. But hopefully I didn't make it too bad. And if you guys are concerned, don't worry. In the examples below, I'm going to have a single force reduction question and I'll also do a wrench type question. So if you guys are saying, you know what, Clayton, I kind of see what's going on, but it's still confusing. Don't worry, I recommend going to the examples. They'll really show you how to solve this in a more realistic application. But yeah, that's it for force reduction. And again, in terms of pre-midterm stuff, this is usually the worst. If you guys are ending this video and you guys are saying, Clayton, this is still a piece of cake. We're good, good. It makes me really happy because it means you guys are good to go for the midterm. You guys will be good to go for basically the rest of this course, except for maybe friction. Again, friction's the one that really causes students to lose their mind, as you guys will see. But we'll cover that another day. You don't have to worry. So yeah, that's it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys in the next lecture video.